On this episode of Bondi Vet... Is this the new recruit? It is. Oh, my God. Scott performs life-saving surgery on an eight-day-old puppy. If he doesn't have the surgery, he will basically fade away and starve yeah. to death. Oh, wow. Look at your eyes, buddy. Alison's on a mission to find a home for a struggling stray kitten. Hey, you've got that beautiful face. Who wouldn't love that face? And how many keepers does it take to catch a wallaby? We've had to call in another two keepers. Reinforcements, the wallabies, giving us a hard time. You make my world a better place. <laughs> Come on, there's your girl. get you into the van and get you all checked out, buddy. Mobile vet Alison and Nurse Amber have just picked up a stray kitten that was found wandering the streets of Brisbane. They're now off to do some tests at a nearby practice after noticing something seriously wrong with the young cat's eyes. Oh, wow. Look at your eyes, buddy. Hey, what happened to you, little guy? I wonder if you can see at all. So the first thing I thought of when I saw this cat is that it just does not look normal. You can see in its face, its eyelids look abnormal. The eyes are very, very small. He might actually be completely blind. Oh, this eye is so recessed in. So you can see that the um, eyelid is actually turned in. So he's got what we call an entropion. It's all right, Baba. So the eyelashes are actually poking into the eye, which is quite uncomfortable. And that would be happening because we don't have the pressure of a normal size eyeball flicking those eyelids out. Alison suspects his abnormally small eyes may be caused by a condition called microphthalmia. He may have been born with this condition. We don't know anything about his background. Or, you know, he may have been exposed to some toxin or virus. Or even his mother might have been exposed to that while he was in the uterus. So we're going to do a quick vision test, which is basically an obstacle course Pop him on the floor and see how he negotiates objects. Have a bit of a wonder. He's definitely using his ears and his whiskers. Yeah. Very unsure. Looking at him, it's quite obvious that he can't really see. He's bumping into things. He's really relying on his other senses, like feel and touch and hearing, to negotiate the objects in the room. He's going towards the sound of people's voice. Yeah. So I'd say he has very, very little to no vision at all. Oh, he's got oh. a deciduous canine, so he's definitely about five and a half months. Oh, Six yeah. months at most. Oh, we're purring. <laughs> you mustn't have got a lot of attention on the streets. We're going to have to give this guy a name. He's pretty cute. He's so cute. What about, I was thinking, like, Rupert? Rupert, Rupert. that suits you. I think it does. Do you like your name? <laughs> All right, let's have a look and see if you are a boy. I was told you were a boy, but let's have a look. It's a bit invasive down there, isn't it? You actually don't have any testicles down yet. At five and a half months, you would expect the testicles to have dropped, but they haven't. So we've got to find out where are they or do they even exist? The missing testicles are another sign of a possible birth defect. See if I can feel if those testicles are in there. The other thing that it could be, but more rarely, is um, that they're actually ovaries. So even though he looks like a male on the outside, he may actually have ovaries instead of testicles that are in the abdomen, which is why I can't feel anything on the outside. So that will be quite interesting to investigate and see what's going on there. It is very unusual for a cat to be in hermaphrodite, um, but seeing that there's other defects and other problems, it's quite a high possibility. Let's go and see where these things are, mister. You ready? All right, Danielle, this is Rupert. We just want to do an abdominal ultrasound today. To look at testicles. Sure thing. We've actually got nothing that's dropped down there. Good boy. It must be in there somewhere. Okay, let's see if we've got testicles down closer to the scrotum. See if they're hiding there. Oh yeah, what's that? It must be that. 
So the good news is that we found testicles. They're actually quite low down. They're on their way out, so that's very good news. So we're definitely a boy. Well, Mr. Rupert, it's been a big day for you today. Hey, you've had a lot of tests done. You've been such a star patient. Hey, you've got that beautiful face. Who wouldn't love that face? My hope for him is that he gets adopted. I mean, his temperament is absolutely gorgeous. And we know that cats with the right care and the right home, when they're blind, can still do really, really well. Let's get you something to eat. Hi. Hi. Hi, Rupert. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Six weeks later, and Rupert's found a new home at another practice and is settling in well. He makes the perfect clinic cat. I can see him sitting there welcoming all the new patients, making them feel comfortable. He's got his own little cubby over there. From living on the street to now having this life of luxury, he's one pretty lucky kitty. And we're so happy he's found a great home. Hey, Charlotte. Hi, Hi Leigh. Okay. Is this the new recruit? It is. Oh my god. In Richmond, Scott's day is beginning with one of the youngest and tiniest patients he's ever seen. An eight-day-old chihuahua puppy. Mm, puppy. Brought in by a very worried owner, Charlotte. He was born with a cleft lip and cleft palate. Oh my god. Let's just have a look and say, oh wow, okay. The deformed palate means every day of the little chihuahua's life has been a struggle. Oh, oh, sweetheart, you're already okay. looking hungry, like you're trying to eat your hot water bottle. Because he can't latch on to either his mum or a bottle, and he isn't putting on weight. At birth, the vet stitched up all the roof of his mouth and stitched up the hair lip, and the hair lip's just not holding. He's had to be restitched three times already. Something more permanent has to be done. With the temporary suture out, is he able to suckle at all? No. no. No, he can't. He hasn't got the vacuum that's needed to get the milk out. Yeah, I mean, look, he's already hungry, you can see. Aren't you, mate? There's now only one option left, more surgery, but this time under anaesthetic, a risky thing for such a young dog. Let's go into the consult room and we'll chat about this very fraught surgery we're going to have to do on you, little man. Come on, then. I have absolutely no choice. I need to perform surgery today. Yes, he's eight days old. Yes, he's a high-risk anaesthetic. But I have no choice because without performing this procedure, he can't latch onto mum, he can't suckle milk, and unfortunately he will end up starving. Well, this type of patient and also this type of surgery is incredibly fraught and not something that we, we want to do. But in his case, if he doesn't have the surgery, he will basically fade away and starve yeah. to death. Yeah, the other possibility is that he can also aspirate the milk, breathe it in and die suddenly. And you've only had him for eight days, but I can tell you, quite smitten, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, he's stolen my heart. Absolutely in love with him. He's like a member of the family already. And I've been hand rearing him for the last eight days. I'm so in love with him already. Well, I'm going to take him downstairs and see the team. Say goodbye to your little man. Good boy. General anaesthetic for an eight day old puppy is never good. It's Never something you want to do, but it really is his last hope. I'm just scared that he's not going to make it. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Right, so we've got a, a difficult job in our hands today, guys. So we're really going to have to keep our wits about us because you can just see the size of that hair lip. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's really sad. But now, unfortunately, the temporary sutures that were put in at birth, you can see, have just blown. And now he just can't clamp down. He can't just get the suction that he needs to, right. to suckle properly. Because you can see there's actually a little tiny, tiny, tiny little hole just there, like a pinhead. But still, yeah. it'll be too big and he won't make it. So we do need to perform an anaesthetic and surgery on this guy. Nurses Nathan and Reagan will assist with the challenging task of anaesthetising such a tiny patient. It's a anaesthetist nightmare, that is. Yeah, well, I think it's anyone's nightmare. Yeah, you know, a young, young animal, old animal, we all know that they are the riskiest. Henry won't make it if we don't do this. 
All right, let's start the process. Just a little bit of anesthetic. Everyone cross your fingers and toes and paws. Because we have to do surgery on his head, mm. we can't have his head in a mask. No. Mm. So when we get down to a point where we think that he's deep enough, we're going to quickly flip him round. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, Reagan, if you can extend his head, and then I'm going to hold down his tongue and try and get the tube in. All right. First task to be tackled is to try and navigate the anaesthetic. Can we place a tube down his throat? Can we place a tube in his nostril? Let's give it a go. So um, you're going to pull the mask off and you're going to spin him round to me, OK? Ready? Three, two, one, go. Scott is hoping a narrow tube down the throat will be the most effective way to administer anaesthetic to his tiny patient. Puppy. But it's proving more difficult than he thought. The tiny little head has a really big tongue and gets in the way of our ability to look and see the larynx and pass that tube through. Yeah, just going to guess him down a bit more, it's too light. What is he on now? Is he on five? Four, four. is on four. So put him up to five. I think what we'll do this time around is we'll just try straight onto this. So we'll go into his nose. Mm -hmm. Try this. Because he's so small, he's got such a fast metabolism, so he's quickly removing the anaesthetic from his system. So he's giving us such a tiny little window to perform this microsurgery. It is really proving tough. OK, okay. let's try again. Attempt number 52. <laughs> Not sure, but maybe. I know it's so difficult to tell, but can you see the bag moving, Reagan? No. Oh, wait, actually. It's like it's sort of working, but not completely. Yeah, so I'm going to take that out and we're just going to try and mask. Oh, that's really... Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so the new plan is basically can't get the tube down and he doesn't seem to be tolerating the nasal tube either, so we're going to keep him nice and deep. You're going to just put it over his nostril. I'm going to scrape. We're yeah. going to put it back on. Okay. All right. The pressure really is on Nathan and Reagan. They're the ones that are responsible for the anaesthetic, maintaining that and ensuring that he recovers from it. All right, let's go for it, everyone. Ready? Three, two, one, go. With the anaesthetic now finally working, Scott can clean up the pup's lip and at the base of his nose. He can then place sutures to permanently hold the edges together. So just uh, take our time, control our nerves. <laughs> And we'll go back in. His heart's beating nice and strongly throughout, so in as much as it's not very nice to hear him cry, it's better that than him not survive. So a little bit of pain for long-term gain. I'm sure he'll thank us eventually. So after the speed surgery and those little windows that I was able to place the sutures, I'm actually really happy with the cosmetic result. The lips have come together. I feel that now he will be able to produce suction in order to feed for mum, and hopefully he'll go on to grow up to be a nice little chihuahua puppy. We've put three sutures in exactly where they need to be. He now has a nostril, he now has a fully formed hard palate. The fact that he fought us so much on the anaesthetic, that he was screaming blue murder at points, just shows his character, and that will really bode well for the future of this little guy. Yeah, gotta love him. <laughs> We did it. <laughs> Here he is. Upstairs, it's been an agonising wait for owner Charlotte. So literally just out of surgery, and it was very, very challenging. But he is as tough as nails. Now you can see why I want you to do it. Yeah. He's got such fright. He really does. <laughs> so we'll be taking the suture out in, well, maybe 10 days, two weeks. We'll see how it goes. We've put a non-absorbable one in there, so it will stay for as long as we feel it's necessary Brilliant. until he's just a bit stronger and a bit bigger. Brilliant. But right now, he's done great. I think you need yeah. to name him. Why don't we call him Cliff? Cliff. Yeah. Yeah. Now to get him home, get him on mum, get him feeding, get him back to bright and alert like he normally is. You guys better get off. He needs to go and have a drink, and I think you need one too. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> All right, then, Charlotte. Take care, sweetheart. And you. Bye. Bye, little man. Home. Hello! Hi! Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I 
little handful of cute there. A few days later, Scott is making an important house call to check on tiny cleft palate patient Cliff. So that's proud mum Dolly, yeah? It is. Bless Hello. Her. Hello, you about to feed your babies? Cliff's holding his own with his brother and sister. He may be the smallest in the litter, but he's certainly not the quietest. But I can see at the same time that those sutures and just the uh, abnormality that he's suffered with is going to mean that long term he's going to struggle to latch on and consume yeah. as much food as his brother and sister. So I would suggest that we do kind of supplement him with a little bottle from time yeah, to time. Yeah, definitely. Funny yeah. you should say that. Ah, I think you look. should do the honours with this one. Oh, yes, please. Look at this. <laughs> some. It's a really wonderful, special moment when you get to bottle feed a puppy because they are looking at you like their mum, they're pouring at you with their feet, trying to sort of pressurise the milk as if they were latched on to mum still, and it's a very special moment for me. Well, I think if this feed's anything to go by, he won't be long before he's catching up with his brother and sister. No. Hey, little man. No, no time at all. Hey. At the Bondi Clinic, bird expert Josh Cook has shattered the peace with a screaming baby. The little sulphur-crested cockatoo was found on a nearby golf course after plummeting 20 metres from his nest. He wouldn't have lasted, you know, overnight without a fox or a dog or a cat eating him. So, yeah, he was lucky to be found. It's a very strange sound coming from the waiting room. Josh has named the noisy cocky Kettle for obvious reasons. Josh. G'day, Chris. How, How are, are you? Yeah, good, mate. So I've got this little cocky who's pretty glad to see you too. He doesn't look too glad to see me. Look at him. No. <laughs> you can see pretty clearly compared to the other good leg, that one's hanging pretty limp. Mm. You've got to be thinking break, but my fear is there may be more than one break and there could also be a dislocation in either that knee joint or the ankle joint. Either way, it's a serious injury. You look at Kettle and he's the absolute picture of vulnerability. He's small, he's skinny, he doesn't have any feathers to his name and he's lost and alone. And he might have a fractured leg. He's in a bad way. He's not known for his silence, Kettle, so it'll take a fair bit to um, subdue this beast. Chris's cranky patient, Kettle, needs his leg x-rayed. Oh, he looks so defeated. That's the fracture we're obviously looking for through there. The fortunate thing for Kettle is that he's probably got one of the best bird people in the country on his side. And, you know, if anyone's going to nurse him through this, it's Josh. All right. How'd he go? Yeah, so he certainly does have a fracture there. Yep. Um, it's, sort of, it's a longitudinal fracture, so it's not straight across. Oh, OK. It's sort of at an angle. Right. Across the bone like that. Yep. But it is only one fracture. It's, it's been a real blessing. The trick's going to be with a we can actually get this to heal. Yeah. The big concern I had from the start was how much nerve damage Kettle had suffered in that foot from that injury. He's still not really clenching his toes. He doesn't really have that perching reflex. 
that's got to start appearing soon. Otherwise, Kettle really doesn't stand a lot of chance of, of being released back to the wild. So you lost your mum, flew out of a tree, broke your leg, stuck in the hot sun, and you had to put up with me. It's a rough day, isn't it? It is about to get better, though. It's going to be very delicate. Okay. <laughs> Incredibly hard to do these splints. For these sort of procedures, we use some very high-tech equipment. Okay. Okay. So they mightn't look like much, but between a set of chopsticks, a paddle pop stick, and a plunger, I can pretty much fix any bird's leg. Just try me. So I think the syringe plunger might actually be the uh, might be the winner. Thank you. So it'll just cushion him if he tries to walk on it. If anyone ever thought they had a bad day, they should look at you to make it off. Look at you, you're having a terrible day. Kettle saviour, bird carer Josh Cook, may just have the answer to silence the pint-sized screamer. <laughs> How do you like that, do you? Still whistling. One more, but look at this. Look at this. You fool. Did it stop the whistling? Not even close. You seem to rest a little, buddy. I'm going to be seeing a lot of Josh over the next few days and then over the next few weeks because these sort of things, they require constant monitoring. There you go. OK. No problem. See you, Chris. Thanks, mate. I'll see you soon. If that splint's too tight, it'll cut off the circulation to his toes and that'll really inhibit healing. But if it's too loose, then that bone's going to keep on moving and the bone won't start to mend. Get that? See you, buddy. Yeah, likewise. Come on through. Thank you. It's a big welcome for Chris at Josh's bird menagerie. Here he is. Kettle, the screaming cockatoo, is ready for his final checkup. Look at you. That's fully dressed now. That little boy's grown up. This is how Kettle looked when Josh first brought him into the clinic after the baby broke his leg. What a difference two months has made. Take the cast off. Look at that. Nice and straight. Moment of truth. Oh. Nice work. Oh, shake it off. <laughs> In a few more months, a lucky cocky should be ready for release. Where's the whistle ball? Hey, you'd be proud of yourself, aren't you? Got our wallaby gear? Most people go to the gym for exercise, but here at the Australian Reptile Park, we catch yellow-footed rock wallabies. This colony is due for their routine health check, but believe me, there's nothing routine about catching these agile marsupials. We got all the gear? Yeah, right. got all the gear. Good. Let's get into it. Might just have a bit of a chat about how we're going to do it first. We'll probably all have the opportunity to catch one of the yellowfoots. If it doesn't go to plan and a roo gets out or, you know, you miss, it doesn't matter. Just let's settle, look at where we are, make sure the roos are safe. So our target is that little guy sitting right there. So that's getting to a size where we're risking mating with siblings. Cannot have that. All right, let's go and set up and catch these roos. Mating with siblings can cause serious genetic defects. Protecting bloodlines is a vital part of their captive management, and that's why we need to catch and microchip the joeys. Yellowfoots are perfectly designed for hopping along rock faces and cliffs. They've got long feet and a strong tail for balance. We don't stand a chance of catching them up there. OK, so let's use this corner. Let's use the angle. We'll just skirt those rocks there, and that way we'll push roos around right into this corner. You'll be coming in and catching your kangaroo right there. So what the guys are doing here is making a, a netting line. 
So what that enables us to do is bring the wallabies around the yard. Once they hit that netting, they're forced into a corner. We'll pick one or two wallabies at a time, that's all. It's safe for them, safe for us, and then we go in and catch. But with yellowfoot rock wallabies, nothing's easy. They can jump three or four metres straight up. We don't want one outside. How fast are they? Well, they're like bullets, and the only way to catch them is by their tail or with a net. Now, that doesn't hurt them at all. I just hope our reflexes are quick enough. This is a big operation. There's five keepers just to catch six wallabies. They're not easy. All right, with the netting set up, it's time to put this plan into action. OK, let's come around in a line. That's it, let's stay together. We've got two over here. OK, we've got two in, Drew. Hold that one there, mate. Just missed him. OK, here they come. OK, we've got one down. That one jumped straight over me. They're hard. That's him. Ooh. It's OK, let him go. Well, it looks like things aren't exactly going to plan. We've had to call in another two keepers. Reinforcements, the wallabies, giving us a hard time. Yes, come in, guys. We've got one here. One right here. Close in. Andrew, come in. Got him. Watch your leg. Easy, Drew. Easy. Good on you. Well done, mate. Yeah, cheers. Putting the yellow foots in sacks is like putting them in mum's pouch. It's dark, comfortable, and won't stress them out. Um, OK, next one, guys. Same again. Come on. Come on. That's it, he's down. I'm in behind you, Drew. Oh, beat us all. <laughs> we got one. We caught one in the net. Missed the corner. One, two, three. Where is he? Keep up, keep the line. Got him. Nice catch, Caroline. Okay, good on ya. Three down, three to go. We've managed to pick a few off. They're not easy. The guys are doing really well. Two in nets and one by hand. He's in here, so just um. Let's hold back. Someone should support me a little bit more here. Just let me see if I can grab tail, I can. Got him. Whoa. Got him. Whoa. OK. Full of fire. One, two, three. I just managed to grab that little one by the tail. The reflexes were good. And that's how it happens sometimes. You set up a plan. We've got a good crash there, but we caught more of the wallabies opportunistically around the edges. You've got to take your opportunities. That's four down, two to go. Drew, there's one up there, mate. Nick, I'm going to bring him to you beyond that tree. Ready? Coming. Good catch, mate. Good catch. Got him there. Grab your net again. Thanks, mate. So far, we've caught five out of six. The only one to go now is the juvenile, but it's doing what yellowfoot rock wallabies do best, and that's hiding in rock crevices. That's exactly what Mum would have taught it to do. Yellowfoots were nearly hunted to extinction, with several populations being wiped out. Young joeys are so important to the future. We must find this one to ensure that it's happy, healthy, and has its own identity. There he is. Got him, mate? Ah, beautiful. That's it, number six. Look how small he is. So he's only a couple of months out of mum's pouch. Now's the right time for us to give him his own identity. All right. The reason we put them into the sacks is because all marsupials find it comforting to be dark and like they're in a pouch as a joey. So once we put him in there, like now, he's already settled. He'll be like he's back in mum's pouch. All six wallabies have been caught and are sitting comfortably in their sacks. First, we weigh them. 8.95. Then, we scan for the microchip. The microchip is our way of identifying each individual animal. And that's really important, because the population is managed genetically. 
We cannot have relatives breeding with each other. No, I can't find the chip. Um... It's the big boy. I mean, we've got scarring on the tail, and, and, and it's our biggest yeah. Yeah, it's male. Good. Okay, I think we should just rechip. Yep, let's do it. Okay. We know this wallaby is our big dominant male, but we can't find its microchip. The scanner's not picking it up. Now, we've searched all over the back and shoulders where the chips are, uh, so the safest thing to do is just to put another microchip in. It's completely painless and only takes a second to put just under the skin, similar to what a vet would do for your dog or cat. Got him. Yep. Easy as that. This is the best bit, letting them go. Off you go. All right, time to check this guy's partner and mum of our Joey. Uh, this is mum. There it is. Look at that teat. OK, and we've got good milk. Gland looks great. One, two, three inactive teats and one long teat. Wallabies are very different than kangaroos. They're always smaller. Uh, they're often very pretty and have far more defined markings than your larger kangaroos. Their legs are shorter uh, and their forearms are strong and stocky. And the base of the tail starts much closer to the ground. They're really agile, makes them hard to catch, but that's what makes them great. Bye, Mum. It's great to identify Mum and just see that she's happy and healthy. Now I want to have a look at a baby, make sure he's the same way. Young male yellowfoots are often bullied by older males. It's another reason why we need to monitor this guy closely. Hey, let go, please. Look at that. Beautiful little boy. That's what it's all about for us. He's two and a half kilos, one year old. And now he's going to get his own identity. The future for this guy is helping his species. Yellowfoot rock wallabies are endangered. Now, he can't breed here in this group because his parents are here, but there are a number of institutions that hold yellowfoot rock wallabies. We work together to keep the species safe in captivity. I can see Mum looking down at him, so I'm going to let him go. He's going to hop right back up. Hey, don't bite me, please. I'm about to let you go. See you next time. Back in his cave, and Mum's just up on top. She's looking down now. Well done, guys. That's a real success. No worries, yeah. mate. It's good. Yeah. Let's hope we've got some more little ones in three months. Sweet. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right, I'm going to leave you wrap up. Cool. See ya.